Hello, Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Abilify or Ripresol. It's primary therapy for schizophrenia and for bipolar disorder. It's an add-on therapy for patients who have major depressive disorder, for children who have tic disorder over age six, or for children who have the irritability associated with autism, again, over age six, if they have aggression or mood swings or self-injury or temper tantrums. On the other hand, it would appear that probably somewhere around 80% of the drug is used incorrectly. It was originally developed by Otsuko Pharmaceuticals in Japan in 1995, and they partnered with Bristol-Myers Squibb to further develop the medicine in 1999. The Food and Drug Administration started off in 2002, gave it approval for treatment of schizophrenia, then in 2004, approval for treating the acute manic attacks associated with bipolar disorder. It gained approval in 2007 as an add-on treatment for major depressive disorder, and in 2009 for the irritation in children or irritability associated with autism. The way the drug works is it supposedly rebalances serotonin and dopamine in the brain. Now, obviously, that theoretically improves the thinking, improves the mood, and improves the behavior. If serotonin and dopamine are off, they're going to alter your mood, your sleep, your ability to learn, your memory, your ability to focus, motor control, pleasure reward centers. You're going to have difficulty with coordinated movements, complex thinking, memory. You're going to have problems with intelligence and language, emotional processing, motivation. But if you have too little dopamine, that's a major problem too. You're going to have decreased sex drive, going to have some tremors, sort of like you would get in Parkinson's disease, and the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. But if you have too much dopamine, that's not good either. You could have overstimulation or addiction or anxiety or insomnia, overactive sex drive, maybe uh, mental illness, obsessive compulsive disorder. Well, how does the drug work for schizophrenia? Does it work well? Well, it seems to be an okay treatment for the signs of acute schizophrenia and maybe for the maintenance treatment to help prevent relapse of the disease. The drug was approved on the basis of five supposedly adequate and well-controlled clinical trials. Four were short-term and they lasted for only about four to six weeks, but they did show a decreased symptoms in people who had acute disease. There was one longer term study and it showed a decreased tendency to relapse compared to placebo. Now, when you look at the studies, four to six weeks in duration, the short term studies, four of the five of them showed that the drug was better than placebo and one of the studies showed it wasn't really any different from placebo. The drug dose is about 10 to 15 milligrams. Doesn't seem that you get any better if you increase the dose still further. Schizophrenia is based on a symptom score, and the symptom score, the test, is known as the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia, or PANSS. The score can go anywhere from a low of 30 to a high of 210. The patients who were studied had a mid-baseline. The baseline was about 100. And looking at how much better the patients improved versus the patients given a placebo, there was really only a 10-point difference between them. Now, it did show that it took a longer time for them to relapse if they were taking the medicine, if they continued to take the medicine. The problem is it can worsen the recovery prospects over the long term. And some patients need continuous therapy, but other patients seem to do better without therapy. So here we have a problem. On the one hand, we can have homelessness and repeated incarcerations and hospitalizations. But on the other hand, if we have too much drug, we have a danger to the individual's health. Well, let's go on and talk about bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder affects about 2.5% of the population, and 1% probably has significant manic attacks. Now, this drug is the first choice for the treatment of mania associated with bipolar disorder, and about 25% of psychiatrists and about one in six doctors in primary care. The problem is, for the acute manic attacks, we have to have some sort of maintenance therapy to prevent recurrent manic attacks, 
realizing, however, that the treatment for the manic attacks probably is not going to be helpful for the depressive effects. So if you have the mania, yes, you could take the Abilify, but typically it's used in combination with some other kind of medicines, maybe lithium, maybe valproate. But if it's used in combination with the mood stabilizers, it might increase the risk of side effects of the Abilify. And also it seems that either lithium or valproate, specifically lithium, seems to be a better treatment for mania. So on a three-week study, using the Young Mania rating schedule, again goes between zero and 60 points, patients mid-range, about 30, well, we decreased the score by about 12 points in people who were taking Abilify, people taking the placebo, they improved their symptoms all the way up to about 10 points. So again, the difference is relatively small and lithium or valproate if the patient's already on one of those two drugs, and then we add Abilify, well then the score is only going to decrease extraordinarily minimally. Now as far as depression is concerned, most depression is treated by non-psychiatrists, doctors who have limited experience in treating people who really have significant depression. Unfortunately, a better treatment for patients who have significant depression is not to add Abilify, but rather to add another antidepressant or a different antidepressant and make sure the patients aren't isolated, make sure the patients have some interaction. And actually for mild to moderate depression, it seems like the antipsychotics not, might not be really all that significant, especially if a person is sad or lacks insight or it's life circumstances, maybe because of poverty or maybe because of death. And in the trials that have been done, comparing Abilify plus an antidepressant or just a placebo plus an antidepressant, it seems like the addition of Abilify doesn't really all add all that much. And a significant problem is that if the drug is used specifically for patients who have mild depression already, well, those patients might have an increased risk of side effects, side effects ranging from increased weight, increased movement disorders. Remember, all for very small to maybe a moderate benefit that probably is not going to increase the quality of life significantly. And if the patients are already taking a selective serotonin uptake inhib reuptake inhibitor, a drug like Prozac or Zoloft or Celexa, well, those drugs are going to interfere with the body's ability to metabolize Abilify, and then the Abilify concentration in the system is going to go up, and then there's an increased incidence of side effects. The benefit from Abilify in patients who have major depressive disorder might simply be that it's acting as a sleeping pill. They seem to get better sleep. And actually, in a study recently performed at the Veterans Administration, fewer than a third of the patients achieved remission of their depression when they were given Abilify. Now, an autism study, how does it work? Well, in eight-week studies of autism, yes, indeed, it, the drug seemed to decrease the irritability, decrease the hyperactivity, it decreased the inappropriate speech, and decrease some of the, the peculiar behaviors. Didn't really significantly change the lethargy, but giving the drug to kids, again, increased side effects, increased weight, increased sleeping, increased drooling, increased tremors. So, we have to observe the ratio, what's the likelihood of benefit, what's the likelihood of harm, and if the patients are taking the drug, have to evaluate whether it's still beneficial to continue the therapy, realizing that overall the benefit might be relatively small. And for obsessive compulsive disorder, again, the benefits appear to be small. Now this drug is highly used in nursing home patients. It's overused, it's used off-label, oftentimes as a sleeping pill for people who have difficulty sleeping, or it's given to people who have dementia, and unfortunately that's quite inappropriate. There's a black box warning on this drug that it can increase the risk of death in the elderly if they happen to have dementia-related psychosis. 
So people who have schizophrenia-like symptoms or dementia-like symptoms may actually have an increased risk of death by taking the drug, increased risk of suicidal thinking, suicidal behavior, especially in children and adolescents and young adults who are also taking antidepressants. And there are a whole list of side effects associated with this kind of a medicine, nausea, vomiting, constipation, headache, and insomnia, typical things, but tremor and blurred vision, anxiety and fatigue and drowsiness and dizziness and lightheadedness. And there's an inner restlessness in up to a third of the patients. We call it akesthesia. And then relatively recently, there's been uh, recognition that this kind of therapy, Abilify, and drugs in the antipsychotic family can cause a pathologic desire to gamble or binge eat or binge shop or even engage in relatively harmful or potentially harmful or excessive sexual activities. This was first noted in Europe and in Canada. Finally, the European Medicines Association updated the label in 2012. In Canada, they did it in 2015. And even though the FDA was warned, it took them until 2016 to make the problem known to the general medical public. And interestingly, people who take Abilify, well, it can increase the euphoric effects of, of methamphetamine, the stimulant effects. And it increases the desire for the methamphetamine in people who are already using the drug, but it can also increase the risk of sudden cardiac death due to arrhythmias. And then there's another side effect. It's called the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's relatively unusual, relatively rare, but it can lead to muscle stiffness and confusion and increased heart rate and fever and sweating. The drugs associated with weight gain about 5 to 8 percent, increased blood sugar in about 1 out of 5 people, and can unfortunately lead to diabetes, especially if we use the liquid form of the medicine. And the liquid form of the medicine has about 15 grams of glucose per dose. That's a heck of a lot. And in the elderly, it seems that it can increase the risk of death, especially if they're psychotic because of dementia. Going on, orthostatic hypotension is another problem associated with the drug, especially if you're dehydrated or if you have cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, orthostatic hypotension. You stand up, your blood pressure falls down, you get dizzy and you can faint, fall down, break a hip. It can cause a decrease in the white blood cells, specifically in the neutrophils, cause agranulocytosis. Your bone marrow just takes a holiday, so you have to monitor frequently, especially if you have a low blood count. And it can lead to seizures or convulsions, especially in people who have a history of epilepsy. And it can cause potential cognitive and motor impairment. It can lead to suicidality. It can lead to something that's called the extrapyramidal syndrome, restlessness and tremor and stiffness and tardive dyskinesia associated with slow jerky motions and peculiar movements of the mouth, chewing kind of disorder, or tongue rolling. And it can lead to dystonia. That's prolonged contraction of muscle groups. It usually occurs relatively early in treatment. It might show up as a spasm of the neck muscle, leads to tightening of the throat, difficulty swallowing, again, protrusion of the tongue, more often in young individuals, with males, and in high doses. Well, you also have to be careful if you're taking this drug about how it interacts with other drugs, certainly with sleeping pills and muscle relaxers and cold and allergy medicines, especially that make you sleepy, or the opioids, hydrocodone, oxycodone, medicines for depression, medicines for anxiety. Shouldn't take it basically if you're pregnant. It can cause harm to the fetus. It's not recommended for women who are breastfeeding. The half-life of the medicine when you take it is pretty long. It lasts for about 75 hours in the body. It's metabolized by a variety of chemicals inside the liver, gets into the brain, it increases the concentration in the brain for up to about 10 to 14 days, then it seems to reach a steady state. About 8% of people lack the enzyme to really digest the medicine, so they're subject to an increased concentration 
And you can have an increased concentration if you take a medicine that blocks its metabolism. If you take biaxin or clarithromycin or Prozac or Paxil, or if you take Diflucan, or if you take some HIV medicines or quinidine, the, decre the, the, the concentration of Abilify is going to decrease in the system. If you take rifampin or if you take Tegretol, and we know that studies have evaluated the worth of the medicine. And one of the, the major organizations that rates medicine is known as the Cochrane Collaboration. And they've looked at Abilify and other medicines in the family, and they find that the dropout rate of therapy is quite high, 25, 30, 40 percent. And the information is of limited quality on these drugs. It's incomplete. It leads to problems that apply clinically, and the quality of the evidence suggesting use of the drugs is thought to be low or very low, and they have a lot of important side effects. On the other hand, if a person's going to take one of these antipsychotics, they often prefer Abilify to other medicines. But there's a lack of outcome data as far as general function, economic function, cognitive function, the mortality. And The Lancet, which is a major British medical publication, evaluated 15 antipsychotics as far as effectiveness was concerned, and they found that Abilify was just in the middle of the range. It's got good overall tolerability, and it seems to be maybe one that can boost the person's energy a little bit more than some of the others doesn't seem to have significant cardiovascular toxicity, doesn't increase the QT wave that would lead to arrhythmias if you're not taking the methamphetamines. Well, in England, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or the NICE as it's called, and the British Association of Pharmaco Psychopharmacology, and the World Federations of societies for behavioral or biological psychiatry really find little difference in preventing relapse among the different antipsychotics. And they say that basically the choice should be patient preference and looking at the side effects. Maybe you switch to this drug if there's too much weight gain with some of the other medicines or too many side effects. But remember, there's no evidence that increasing the dose can lead to increased benefits. So 10 to 15 milligrams seems to be the standard therapy for schizophrenia or for mania. However, in children, a smaller dose obviously is for smaller people, so we start off at a dose of just about 2 milligrams. In major depressive disorder, maybe between 2 and 5 milligrams, then they can be increased. Well. The drug was off patent, came off patent. When it was on patent, it was a major seller. Now that it's off patent, we have other forms of the medicine. So it doesn't have to be taken as either as a pill or as a liquid. Now it could be taken as a shot, an injection. And an injection can last all month. So that's relatively good, but the injectable form is only good for schizophrenia and people with bipolar disorder. Now, on the other hand, a doctor who was the past director of the National Institute of Mental Health, that's part of the NIH that you hear so much about in Bethesda, Maryland, that's the government-funded research organization. Well, Thomas Insull, who was the head of that organization, a psychiatrist, said that, you know, the way we diagnose schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or any of these other disorders psychiatrically, well, we don't really have any objective measures behind our diagnoses. They're nothing more than the constructs that panels of experts have come to originate. And he says that our diagnoses at the present time are basically pseudoscience, and this is from the director, the ex-director, the past director, of the National Institutes of Mental Health. And what he says is that we have to stop funding research based on symptoms. And what we need to do is we need to get some more biology associated. We need to study our genetics and the imaging and the cognitive science. And we need to acquire other levels of information in order to make the correct diagnoses. Because if 
all we're doing is looking at people who have symptoms. It could be a variety of different diseases that have the same kind of symptoms. And we need some consistency from one doctor to another in making these diagnoses. Now this was, as I said, a big seller. It was bringing in about $7 billion a year for a drug that many people have never heard of. Now it's off patent. But in 2016, this was the drug that cost Medicaid more than 90% of all of the other drugs. This is a major drug that's pushed a lot for a variety of psychiatric disorders and unfortunately it's highly overused as I said the company settled with the US government for half a billion dollars several years ago because they were making off-label claims about how good the drug was for children and for older people who had dementia. Well dementia how much is it going to cost if you want to go and buy the medicine? Well, if you get the generic 15 milligram variety, the cash price, if you want to go and plunk down some cash, is anywhere between $730 and $960 a month, or about $32 a day to take this pill. $32 a day. Now, if you have a coupon that you can get a good RX, it's only about $10 to $20 or $30 or $40 a month. Well, there's a significant amount of wiggle room in between those two numbers, so there's some profit going somewhere. If you go in with a coupon to Walmart, the current price is cash. Additional to the coupon is $312. If you go to Walgreens, addition to the coupon, it's going to be $250. If you go and you buy the brand name, it's going to cost you about $950 cash. So, here we have a drug, Abilify, that has an awful lot of baggage. It's overprescribed. It doesn't seem to work nearly as well as most people believe. It's very difficult to differentiate Abilify from other drugs in its class. It has a wide range of pretty horrible side effects. And remember, it provides minimal to modest benefits at a horrible price to both the individual and to society. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.